The story you are about to hear is true. The names have not been changed to protect the guilty. It's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to bring the good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captive free, to comfort those who mourn, to bring the oil of gladness and the mantle of praise that wherever I may be, any given second of my life, the Lord God shall be planted. And in that planting, only he and he alone shall be glorified. I come to you not as a preacher, not as a pastor. I come to you not as a teacher either, but if there is one title that I have carried the majority of my life, it's that of a witness. Being profoundly deaf since the age of 18 months, my eyes have been everything to me to behold the majestic splendor of his beauty, to be able to communicate with people by watching their loves and being able to read them. A witness in which I have seen the great and mighty things of the Lord that he has done in my life and also in the lives of the people around me. It is a privilege to follow the footsteps of that woman found in the Bible that Christ first revealed himself to on that Sunday morning of his resurrection. He commanded the woman to go to the disciples to let them know that he had risen he had risen indeed. And in that one small moment, for the life of that woman, she has set the examples of women in our churches today to proclaim him, to know him, and to make him known. Now, some of you might have remembered that TV show called Sue Thomas, FBI. And as I travel around the country speaking, I find that I keep getting asked three most popular questions. Question number one, are you the real Sue Thomas? <laughs> I was when I woke up this morning. <laughs> Question number two, how long did you work for the FBI? only for three and a half years, just long enough to get a TV show out of it. <laughs> and question number three, did you really run down the street catching the bad guys? Do I look like I ran down the street catching <laughs> the bad guys? It's been an awful lot of fun. And I could never ever imagine how God would take that TV series in order to proclaim him and to make him known. You know, if you look back on my life, it has all the elements for Hollywood, the drama, the action, the intensity, the loss. And yet, when it came down, to actually telling 
the real story of Sir Thomas. Hollywood wouldn't even touch him. And I, I'm going to take you behind the scenes. I'm going to share the story that Hollywood wouldn't even touch. Oh, the world has come to think that Sue Thomas is, is unique, the sort of a celebrity. But what they have no idea is that the real Sue Thomas is God's greatest sinner saved by his grace. It's been a little over 25 years since I came to the foot of the cross and I surrendered. I gave up my life that my Lord might live in me, that he would complete me, that he would strengthen me. 25 years has passed, and yet I remember the day, that moment, when he first came into my life. I will never, ever forget him. 25 years ago, I attended Columbia Bible College and Seminary. And as I started my 25th year, I had a desire to be able to see Dr. Robinson McQuilkin, who was president of the college at the time when I was there. I wanted to be able to see him, to thank him for the precious gift that he had so given to me when I was a student there that I arranged to attend a conference where he was speaking. And when I saw him, the emotions, while well, probably was nothing short this side of heaven. And I said, Dr. McCorkin, I really would like to have some quality time with you, and just as soon as possible. And he agreed to meet with me the very next morning. And on my way to the meeting with him, I happened to meet the current president of Columbia Bible College and Seminary, Dr. Bill Jones. And he came up to me and said, Sue, I've heard so much about you. I want some time with you. And I said, that's great, Dr. Jones. I'm on my way right now to a meeting with Dr. McQuilkin. I said, it's a homecoming that I've been looking forward to, and if you would like, you may join us. So that day, I sat with the two men and also my traveling companion, Deborah. And we sat at a round table. And I looked at Dr. McQuilkin, and I said, you know, I have a question for you. I said, during your tenure as president of the college, do you remember if you ever expelled anybody or if they kicked them out? And he looked a little puzzled. And then he came back and said, no, I don't think that I did, but I honestly can't answer that truthfully because I really can't remember. Then there was a long pause, and he leans forward a little bit, and he looks me straight in the eye, and he said, did we kick you out? <laughs> so much for the homecoming. I mean, it's those defining moments that you will never, ever forget. They kind of linger, and they last forever. But in the course of the 25 years that I came to the foot of the cross, I've had plenty of time to reflect on where I have been and what I have done. And I have to admit, it has been an incredible journey that even I have a hard time believing what has taken place. That journey started out very early in my life, at the age of 18 months, 
when very suddenly in the evening, I went profoundly deaf. There was never a cause known. I wasn't sick. I just had my hearing one moment, and the next moment, I was walking the path of silence. My parents had a very difficult decision to make, whether to send me away to a deaf institution or whether to keep me at home and try to help me in every imaginable way that they could. I was their only daughter. I was their youngest. They didn't want to send me away. And with that, they took a side and vowed to do everything possible to help me to live in the world of sound. Various therapy was done to instill a voice and speech. Years was spent with a speech therapist in front of a mirror with my hand on her throat feeling the vibes and making those same vibes. At the same time, I would be looking in the mirror, watching her form, her lips to make the word, and then for me to try to form my lips the same way. After years of speech therapy came voice lessons. No, not for a professional thing, but only to get my voice to fluctuate, to go up and down and up and down. And after years of voice, came dramatic reading, only for the articulation and enunciation of words. So many, many years has gone into this voice, and yet I know I still talk funny. And people say, oh, no, you don't, but I do. Well, how do you know that? Well, I can be at the airport, a restaurant, a hotel, any place at any time. And somebody will always come up to me and say, where are you from? <laughs> you really have an accent. <laughs> it's just a little bit different. And I'm aware of that. And yet, what deems to be my greatest weakness has turned to be an incredible strength and asset. Because you have to admit, when you're not accustomed they're hearing a voice like mine. They kind of sit real still and listen to make sure you don't get anything or forget anything. So tonight, pay attention <laughs> because I'm going to say some words that you probably have never heard of before in your life. The therapy. How did I ever realize that it would be my greatest weakness and caused me my greatest pain. I went to public school. Teacher put me in the first row so I'd be able to read the lips as best as I could. I really didn't understand too much, but I tried to follow what the class was doing. And I remember that day, as far as watching the students stand by their death, and I finally figured it out. They were introducing themselves to their classmates. Mm -hmm. It became my turn that day, and I remember getting up and standing beside my desk and very proudly looking out at my classmates and saying something like, ah! Ah! <laughs> And with that, the entire class erupted in laughter. <laughs> Those kids were laughing so hard that day. I turned around to try to figure why everybody was laughing. And when I couldn't figure it out, I just sat down. But I came to realize that every time I was to open my mouth to speak, the entire class would erupt in laughter. And I got to the point where I wouldn't open my mouth. For 12 years, I sat in the silence. And never once did I open my mouth in that school. The defining moment of having my teacher come up to me one day at my death 
And she looked awful sad that day, and she reached down and took my hands in hers, and she led me out of the classroom. And that day, it seemed like it was an awful long walk. And that was the day I entered another class. I entered what was known as the dummy class. And now all these kids had more ammunition to work with. I just didn't talk funny. I was now the dummy. There were three things in my life as a child that saved me from total despair. One, my parents went to church on Sundays, and they tried to instill in me that there was a God, a supreme being, that did not make any mistakes. They tried to tell me about his son named Jesus, and that if I would hold on to his hand, and allow him to lead me and guide me, that there wouldn't be anything that I couldn't do or anything that I couldn't become. Secondly, I had a song. Did you get that? I had a song. No, I have no recollection of music. But I had a mother that loved music. And she wanted to pass that love onto her only daughter, whether she could hear it or not. And as a little kid, she would place me on her lap as she sat in the rocking chair, rocking back and forth, singing all of her favorite songs. With my head on her shoulder as she sang, I could feel the vibrations. And if I really liked the song particularly well, my hand would sort of creep up and lay gently on her throat so that I could get all the vibes that I possibly could. It must have been around Christmas time because one of the first songs that my mom ever taught me was Silent Night. And I loved that song. No. As a little kid, it wasn't the words. The words had no meaning. Rather, it was the rhythm and the flow that brought forth tremendous peace. And I can remember, after a long, lousy day of school, going home on the school bus, looking out the window, with my nose all pressed up against the glass, so nobody seeing the tears flow down my chin. Way down deep, I would start singing fight at night, and I'd be okay. <laughs> the only thing I ever wanted as a kid was a friend. Let's face it, who wants to be a friend to a dummy? Who wants to be a friend to somebody that talks funny? And I never knew what the word friendship meant. At least not until I got to high school. And by the time I went to high school, I met up with those crowds that were totally disrespectful, outright rebellion, into alcohol, into drugs, into everything. And it was my means of escape, at least trying to escape the world of silence. God's hand was upon me, for he brought in a teacher in my junior year that believed in me and began to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. It was through her life I went to college. And even though I got to college, it took me eight years to leave the place. <laughs> eight years passed. I thought the world couldn't wait to give me a job. But I found out the world could wait forever. There wasn't one person that was willing to give me a job simply because I couldn't use the telephone 
or they thought that I would misunderstand what was being said. And I went back to the same hearing and speech center that taught me to speak, pounded on their doors asking for a job. They felt sorry for me. Why? They hired me even when they didn't have a job. I became like a gopher, a jack of all trades, doing whatever they wanted me to do. And I can remember some days taking paper clips out of one box, sticking those paper clips in another box, and then putting them in the closet. I was only there for a few short months when God was still busy writing the script for my life. You see, it was a friend at the Hearing and Speech Center, who in turn had a friend that lived in Washington, D.C., who in turn had a friend that worked for the Department of State, who in turn had a friend that worked for the FBI. Are you following this? <laughs> so a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend from Washington, D.C. to Youngstown, Ohio, I get wind that the FBI is looking for deaf people. And if you don't think that I panicked, I thought to myself, what did we do? <laughs> it took them a long time to calm me down that day. <laughs> Basically, they said you didn't do anything. They just want to know if you want a job. So I want a job. Somebody was finally going to hire me for who I was. Scratch that. I'm going to Washington, D.C. That's awesome. But the more I realized it, the more I knew I was going to be with the FBI. It just doesn't get any better. So off I go to Washington, D.C. And the first week is like a dream come true. They took me around. They introduced me to all the special agents. And after all the introductions was over, they took me downstairs to the firing range where all the agent practiced their target shooting. That was the very first mistake. The second mistake is when they handed me a Thompson 45 submachine gun. <laughs> I shot up their entire shooting that day without even trying. It was a long time before they let me go back downstairs. <laughs> and then I started my training to become what was known as the fingerprint examiner for the FBI. Within the first five minutes, I realized I had made the greatest mistake in my life. Someday, when you don't have anything else to do, take a look at any one of your fingers really, really close. All those lines are fingerprints. It was my job to count every single one of those lines on that finger, eight hours a day, five days a week. And I can honestly tell you, if you've seen one fingerprint, <laughs> you've seen them all. <laughs> one day, my supervisor comes running in. She's all upset. She tells me I have to get to the front office right away. There's only two reasons a person goes to the front office of the FBI. Either to be terminated from their job or to be interrogated by the FBI agents. I get to the front office, I walk in, and they tell me to sit down. And that day, the question started. And they went something like this. Miss <coughs> Thomas, we understand that you read lips to communicate, and you do a very good job. But there's only one thing we want to know, just one thing. Do you watch TV? <laughs> do I watch TV? That's all you guys want to know? It's not a federal crime to watch TV. <laughs> I confess, I watch TV. <laughs> well, is it difficult for you, Miss Thomas? Do you get anything out of it? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't. 
I mean, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, the camera's on the person, and I can see their lips. I can read them. But so many times the camera's not on the person that I can't see anything, so I don't know when anything's being said. Well, how about movies, Miss Thomas? Do you go to movies? Is it any better for you? Oh, yes. I go to movies. And it's a lot better, it really is, you know. It's the lips, they're a lot bigger. <laughs> on and on went the question. And I came to realize that the FBI had a huge problem. They were working on a case in which they video filmed the suspect. But when the camera activated, the sound mechanism failed. They had all this film with the bad guys talking. They just couldn't hear it. They wanted to know if I would sit and watch the film and write any words down that I could. I said, sure, no problem. From that day on, I never went back to reading fingerprints. <laughs> From that day on, I read lips for the FBI. And they sum up my job. I followed the bad guys around, and I read their lips. Then I went and told the good guys what the bad guys were saying. <laughs> and they even paid me to do it, too. <laughs> and overnight, like the snap of a finger, I finally made it in the world of sound. Good job. Good selling. Somewhat of a novelty in Washington where I began to be invited to congressional and senators' party. And for three and a half years, I lived in the fast lane of Washington, D.C., celebrating my success. Who could have imagined? If you would look back on my life, with the laughter and the ridicule of being a dummy and talking funny, I was actually the moving target in school for the bullies. And all of a sudden, from the moving target, I'm the FBI's secret weapon. <laughs> I mean, you talk about a transformation, how life can change. Given enough time, anything can happen. I'm 35 years of age when I'm at the prime of the FBI. But basically, I was one happy person. And I'd been a very unhappy person for a real long time. 35 years, I walked the path of silence. And for 35 years, I have hated every step, step that I took. When I was young, my parents tried to instill in me that God never made a mistake. And in my youth, I believed them and I held them. But supposedly with each passing year of getting older and supposedly wiser, I began to doubt that. That by the time I'm with the FBI, I totally doubted God. And I wanted to confront him once and for all. I wanted him to confess that, yes, indeed, he had made a mistake. So I resigned from the FBI to go to Columbia International Seminary, CIU, in South Carolina, not to go there to become a preacher, and not to go there to become a missionary, but with only one objective, to confront God face to face, to ask him why he made a mistake. 
The mistake wasn't minor, it was major. I mean, after all, anybody that would know of the mistake would have consideration of why I had to do this. It wasn't enough that he created in me a heart that loves people. I love people. And that came by God's creation that he put within me. But it's compounded by the issue that even though he created that love and I want to be with people, he allowed the silence to overtake me that it was physically impossible to be with people. That, my friends, is a mistake. It's a whopper. You don't give somebody something and then remove it in a tangible way where they can't have it. At least this is what my warped mind thought. Helen Keller said it best when she said blindness separates a person from things and objects. Deafness separates a person from people. She's right. Oh yeah, I'm a good lip reader. In my prime, I could be in a high-rise building in New York City with a pair of field glasses looking across the street in another high-rise building and telling you word for word what was being said. I'm good, or I was. I'm so good I can even do two people. And, and that's like watching tennis. Somebody will talk, they'll stop. They'll talk, they'll stop. They'll talk, they'll talk, they'll talk. I can get it. <laughs> but you had a third person and a fourth person. I start deteriorating. I cannot function in a room. And my heart wants this so desperately and so badly. Do you know, I know that the day that I stand before him and he looks and finds my name in the book of life, right next to my name, there's gonna be a hyphen with a notation. Greatest party animal. <laughs> I love to party. I love to be with people. But I can't. I can't. Did you ever want something so much? So much that you would do anything to get it? Confess. That's who we are. We have the mindset. We think of ourselves. When we want it, we will go for it. We will achieve it. Sometimes we'll do it in any way that we can, but by golly, we're going to get it. In his creation, aside from giving me the heart, he gave me a double dose of strength. He knew that I needed to be strong. He knew that I would be alienated, that I would be lonely on that path of silence all the days of my life. He knew that I would experience the rejection over and over and over again. So he gave me a spirit of strength that at all on, that at all come, I wouldn't stop going. And that, my friends, is a tremendous blessing when it is used for God. But when it is used for yourself and for your desires and for your wants, it will totally destroy you. And not only you, but everybody around you. I got to seminary, God was waiting. You see, 
he didn't just give me one or two friends in seminary that I could relate to. He had 25 friends waiting for me. 25. I can't be with three people, let alone 25. And yet, every day, we go to class together, we would share meals together, we would study, we would pray, we would sing, we were always together. And these people saw the outward shell of St. Thomas, the party animal, happy-go-lucky, the lie. Because what they didn't know is that when I left their midst and I went back to my apartment, I totally destroyed everything that I could get my hands on the bitterness and resentment started during the first year of first grade. What that? That puts me at six years old. From the age of six to the age of 35, that baggage was growing with each passing moment that I was a broken person. I was a resentful person. I despised. There wasn't a shred of happiness within me. And now I'm with 25 new friends. So many times I cried out to God, please give me my hearing. Please just let me hear. And it was always the same answer. The great silence. I wanted so desperately. And I was going to get it no matter what the cost. So I turned from God. I more or less gave up on Him. And I went my own wayward way with a perverted mind. I went to the one friend in seminary and I told her a lie. I told her that I had a terminal disease that I was dying. Why? Why would you do such a thing? How could you do such a thing? Because in my warped mind, I thought if she believed me, she would want to spend as much time with me one-on-one. -on -one. And that's exactly what happened. But what I didn't realize, the split second that I told that lie, that it would last for over seven months. And I had no idea that the first person I told that lie to, that would have fanned out of those 25 people. And surely, I had no idea that that lie would totally consume me and destroy me. Seven long months passed, and I was wasting away. And there came a time when God said, enough, no more. And his hand came down heavily upon me to the point where my state became so confused on a daily basis that I could not take it any longer and I went to that same friend and I said, please call my advisor at school. Tell him that I need to see him as soon as possible. Tell him to have another faculty member with him. It's urgent. And I met with those two men, tears streaming down my face. I confessed my sin. I knew that I would have to go to those 25 different people and to tell them the truth. And I was prepared to do that. I wanted to do it. But what I didn't know 
is that I would have to stand before the entire academic committee of that school the night before I was to meet that committee. It was the longest, darkest, quietest night of my life. The shame and the guilt was so unbearable that I got my suitcase out and I began to pack to run away. I couldn't face it. And while I'm packing, my Bible fell on the floor and it fell open that I reached down and I picked it up and I sat on my bed with the Bible in my lap and I looked down. And when I looked down, I sort of chuckled and I shook my head because I could not believe the pages that were staring back to me. The Bible fell open to the book of Hosea. Hosea. How many times do we go to the book of Hosea? <laughs> I mean, do most people even know that there is a book in the Bible called Hosea? And I'm looking down at this page and it really gets my attention and my interest, so I start reading it. And as I read it, the tears started to flow. And in disbelief, I put the Bible on the bed and I went down on the floor, face down. And I cried out for God for mercy, for forgiveness that I told him that for 35 years, I went to church, I sat in the pew, I sang the hymn, I talked the talk and told people I was a Christian. How dare I? I wasn't any more of a Christian than those that won't even profess him as Lord and Savior. I knew what was inside of me. I knew that I did not hold one decent thing that was always myself in my ways and what I wanted. I told him that I couldn't live that way anymore. That I'd rather die. That night, being flat on the floor, I surrendered my life and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. And I knew that I would never ever take another step in my lifetime that was not his and his will for me because I couldn't live any other way. The next morning, I stood before the entire academic committee, tears streaming down my face. And my speech was so garbled with the emotion. I knew they had a hard time understanding me. I told them that the only reason that I made it was because last night in my darkest hour, God gave me a promise, a promise that was found in the book of Hosea, and that I was holding to that promise for dear life. Then in my darkest hour, my most shameful hour, I heard the voice of God that even deaf people can hear when they know. I shared that the promise I was holding it for the power and the strength to bow humbly before them 
to confess my sin and my shame. And that there wasn't any other way that I would have made it through the night. And that day, 25 years has passed since I stood before those men and shared the promise that God gave me. That promise is still as real today and as vibrant as it was that night in my shame. When he said to me, Oh, Thomas, return to the Lord your God, for you've been crushed by your sin. Take words and come back to me, for my anger will be forever gone. I will love you freely, Thomas. You will blossom like a lily. Your roots will go deeply into the soils of Lebanon. And your people shall return from exile far away and will rest beneath my shadow. The one thing that I remember more than anything else on that day of my confession with that soul was one lone man sitting in a chair. His head was in his hands. And as he heard me speak, he shook his head back and forth. And as I watched him, the tears flowed down his face. That man was Dr. Robinson McCorkum, the man that I could not wait to meet 25 years later for thanks. In the days before that meeting, the emotions ran so high. What will I say to him? What can I say? And that day finally arrived. And wouldn't you know it, they sat me right next to him at a dinner table. He looked at me, and the first word that he spoke was, Sue, I'm so proud of you. I looked at him, and the tears began to flow. And I choked them, and I took my napkin, and I placed them on the table, and I said, you have to excuse me. And I walked out, and I went outside, and I kept thinking, God, he doesn't remember. He can't remember. He said he was proud of me. So I regained my composure, and I went back, and I was able to finish the meal, and at that time I said, Dr. McQuilkin, I need to see you as soon as possible, or you meet with me. And he said, yes, tomorrow morning. I looked at him, and I said, did you ever kick anybody out? Did you ever spell anybody? And he looked puzzled, and he looked at me. He said, I don't think so, but I'm not sure. And then there was the great silence, and he said, did we kick you out? No, sir, but you could have. And maybe you should have, but you didn't. Instead, you taught me the biblical principle of the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. 
and you just didn't stop with the love. You walked me through the healing process by telling me that the stipulation for me to stay was with biblical counseling. And it wasn't enough that you loved and you forgave me and then you helped heal me. You restored me. And then you sent me. I don't know where I would have been had you kicked me out. But from that day on, Dr. McCorkin, I only had one desire and one desire alone to go to every nation, to stand before every single generation, to proclaim the love and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. But I didn't know how God would answer that prayer. And yet for him, it was like the snap of a finger. All he had to do was a TV show called Sir Thomas FBI. Here in the United States, over four million people have watched it. Today, that show is being seen in 65 nations around the world. Germany, South Africa, Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, 65 nations. And the people write to me thinking they're writing this celebrity. And I have the opportunity to share a celebrity now. God's greatest sinner, saved by grace. Yes. I have that desire to be able to proclaim him now that I know him, now that I love him, to make him known and to bear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. We try to witness the people and they get as many into the church by saying it's so easy to be a Christian. And we use scripture in the sense that we can't earn it, we can't deserve it. It's a free gift from God, and that's right. But let's tell them the whole truth. Let's tell them that it is the most difficult thing that they will ever do in their lifetime to come with the faith. <coughs> because it's only when you do it and you take that step and you die and you surrender that you won't know how to live as a Christian. It's not about the American gospel. It's about the gospel that's found in the sacred word, inspired by God. He tells us what we have to do. It's not about showtime. It's about dying. That we might live. Friends, that is the real story of Sue Thomas, FBI. Firm believer in Jesus. That is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. <laughs>